Let's pray. Father, we ask that you speak to us now through your word. May you speak to each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have taught and preached about the second coming since the founding of our denomination in 1863. That is, for over 150 years. And we have always used the word soon, soon, soon. Generations have come and gone. We are told that God could have come <clears throat> much sooner than this. Why are we still here? Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter, <clears throat> the third uh, verse, I'm sorry, chapter. 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Hastening the coming of God. The Bible is telling us that we can hurry up the second coming. That's what it just said. That we have a part to play in the timing of the second coming. That's what the scriptures tell us. Look what it says in Matthew 24. This tells us one of the ways we can hasten the second coming. Matthew 24 and verse 13. Matthew 24 and verse 13. Jesus says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So that's one of the things that has to happen. Also, something else has to happen, and that is found in Revelation 14, starting with verse 6, and it is, and I've said this before, but for those of you who don't know, it's depicted here on the, on the uh, glass, the three angel's message, Revelation 14, 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tongue, tribe, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven, the earth, the sea, the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. So these are two things that have to happen before the Lord comes. <coughs> the preaching of the gospel as a witness to all nations, and the three angels' messages. But is that it? Once those things are done, is that all that needs to happen for the Lord to come? No, that's not quite it. Then what else? Some people would say, well, we need more suffering, more wars, more evil. But that's not 
what the Lord is waiting for. No, it's more righteousness. More righteousness brings, believe it or not, more evil. Satan and his followers have always been aroused by godliness. You remember the story when Mary, when Mary uh, washed Jesus' feet? And it was such a blessing to Jesus that it was one of the things he remembered on the cross that encouraged him gave him the strength to get through that awful time, Mary's great act of kindness. And it was a great blessing to Jesus, and Satan saw that. So he had to try and take it away and mess it up right away. So he told Judas to say, oh, this uh, perfume is expensive. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor, trying to crush this beautiful spirit that had just happened there. And it has always been that way. The more righteousness that is in the earth, the more Satan and his followers seek to oppose it. And I think that's, that's one of the factors why many of us are afraid to get really serious about Jesus because of the opposition that we will face. If we go back to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16, the verses that we read earlier, I believe you could say it's all summed up right there, what God wants to do in his people. 2 Corinthians 5, and let's just focus, well, let's read 16 and 17. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The old is supposed to be gone completely. But the old is not gone in too many of us, is it? Lying, cheating, selfishness, pride, lust, etc., etc., etc. Some may say, well, most of the old is gone, but there is a group. There is a group that will be formed where all of the old will be gone. And there will be a complete and full embracing of the new. You know this group. We've talked about them many times. Let's turn to one of the descriptions of them in the last book of the Bible, Revelation 7. Revelation 7. These are some of the most startling words in all the Bible. Revelation 7, after these things, I saw four angels, verse 1, standing at the four corners of the earth. They are holding back the devil and his angels and his followers, those humans who can't wait to do evil. And the Lord will allow it to burst forth on the world. So they are holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God, of our God, in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, one hundred. And 44,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So what is God waiting for? Why has he not come yet? Some will say, based on what we looked at earlier, he's waiting for the gospel to be preached all over the world as a witness to all nations. He's waiting for the three angels' messages to be preached. But according to this verse, these verses that we just read, 
That's not it. Because you know what? He can finish the preaching of the gospel in all nations in a matter of weeks. He can finish the preaching of the three angels' messages in a matter of weeks. No, he is waiting for this group to be formed. That's what he's waiting for. That's what the second coming hinges on. That's how we can hasten the time of the second coming. God is not going to drag us into heaven. He's not going to push us into heaven. He's not going to scare us into heaven. He is waiting for this special group to be formed. And when it is and they are sealed he will unleash the chaos that we've read about in both Daniel and in Matthew. As soon as he has 144,000 people, faithful ones, in whom 2 Corinthians 5.17 is fulfilled, fulfilled, he will seal them and release the winds and allow the devil and all of his followers to bring a time of trouble such as never was nor ever shall be. Here's the blessing. Here's the blessing. Look what it says. We're, we just started Sabbath school, the book of Daniel. Look what it says in Daniel 12 about this time period. Daniel 12 and verse 1. This is Daniel's last chapter and a very important one, Daniel 12, 1. At that time, it's a time just ahead for us. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Now let's go to Matthew 24, and it tells us also about this awful, awful time. Matthew 24, starting with verse 21. Matthew 24 and verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Thank, thank the Lord, this will be a short time. So who are the 144? They are the people that believe the Bible. All of it. They do not focus on their own failures and their own mistakes and their own weaknesses, on their own sins, but instead they focus on the power of God and on his goodness and his desire to bless. It's always amazing how we as Christians like to get together and talk about how weak we are. And how many times we fail. And how bad the world is. And how bad we are. And how bad the church is. And how bad everything is. That's not going to get us anywhere. The headlines are filled with news about people sitting. Headline flash. More people sin. As if that hasn't happened the day before and 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 the day before for thousands of years. And we as Christians, we fall into that same thing. Instead of talking about the power of God that old things are to pass away and all things are to become new, we say, yeah, yeah, I'm weak, I can't do anything, yeah, this will never happen, and the Lord will just come when he's tired of us and can't take it anymore, and and when he's so fed up, and then eventually he'll show up and kind of shake his head and say, well, I couldn't wait any longer. <laughs> That's not what the Bible says at all. Maybe when we get together,
and talk, we should talk about the precious promises of God. We should talk about what God will do for us because he says he will do it for us. Not how many times we failed. We've all failed many times. That's not, that's not a, a topic that's going to help anybody. The 144 will be those who focus on the good things of God. Notice what he says and the Lord says about himself in Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23. Jeremiah 9, 23 says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man, this is so beautiful, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in his in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Why don't we focus on what the Lord delights in instead of focusing on the failures of our lives, our, our tries, of the failures of this world, of the darkness, of all the bad things that are constantly happening, why don't we delight in what the Lord delights in? Why don't we focus on what He delights in? He doesn't delight in suffering or pain or evil. So why do we focus on these things? The 144 will focus on the loving kindness of God his judgment, and his righteousness. How many people do we know of that have been translated without seeing death because that's what's going to happen to the 144, isn't it? How many do we know that that has happened to? Just two, right? Enoch and Elijah. Now, the spirit of prophecy tells us that Enoch thought about Day after day, moment after moment, his meditation wasn't on the evil all around him. Wasn't on the weakness in mankind or in himself. His meditation was on the love of God. And you know, we have an advantage over Enoch. Enoch lived about 3,000 years before Jesus. He did not see the condescension of God. He did not see the terrible sacrifice. He did not understand the complete sacrifice that God would make for his creation. And yet, with less knowledge of the love of God, he was able to achieve a relationship with him that allowed him to be taken into heaven without seeing death. We have so much more information about the love of God. We should be able to believe it more. And rejoice in it more. And walk with him more. Because we have more understanding than Enoch could have had 3,000 years before Christ. This is what the 144 learned to do. Focusing on the power and the love of God and on his precious promises. How do we do that? One key way to do that, we must get control of our thoughts. Not just some of them, not just most of them, but all of them. If a bad thought comes into our mind, we have to get rid of it immediately. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians 10. It tells us how to do this. This must be done if you are going to receive the fullness of the promises of God. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We think too much about the flesh in the battle with God. I have this kind of personality. I have that kind of personality. Does it matter? God 
can bless anyone. God can fill anyone with his righteousness if we are willing. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The Lord is waiting for people that really believe this. That the weapons of our warfare are mighty. Mighty in God. Casting down arguments, verse 5. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What I meant earlier when I said the 144 believe all of the Bible, they believe verses like this. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. If God asks us to do it, he can do it in us if we'll let him. But if we're always saying, well, that's impossible. I've never seen that. Psychologically, Freud says, my professor at college says, the Internet article says, what does God say? He, he's asking us to believe him. He has a track record of being true. This is what the 144 are able to do. They accomplished this. God has already seen the 144 in the future. God is calling on his people now to take seriously his promised gift of holiness so he can come. He wants to come more than we want him to come. But it's about free will. It's about what he has to do in those last day people. They have to be a perfect reflection of him and his holiness so he can come. Enoch was able to see the second coming of the Lord thousands of years ago. We find it in Jude, the first chapter. Jude only has one chapter, but in the In the book of Jude, in the 14th and 15th verse, God gave Enoch a view of the second coming. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. God's view of the future is as much fact as history which has already happened. If God saw the 144, the 144 will be formed. And there may be a bunch of Christians standing around saying that's impossible, that can't happen. It will happen. But it won't include us if we talk and think like that. We limit and restrict the power of God. Remember Jesus kept saying, according to your faith, may it be so to you. Remember Jesus could not do many miracles in and around Nazareth because of their lack of faith. It's not that God is weak. But our lack of faith prevents him from working. He's waiting for us to believe what he says. And he even, he even takes us to the end. You know, it's kind of like you get a book. And I haven't done this very often. I, probably you haven't either. But sometimes maybe you want to see how it ends. So you go all the way to the back to see how it ends. God tells us how it ends. He says, this is what's going to happen. All that matters, are you going to be a part of this group or not? That's what matters. It's going to be wonderful. As they say on uh, the TVs and the movies, 
stay tuned for the coming attractions and the marvelous works of God. He will have a people. He will get to a point where he finds people that really believe his word and leave the old gone and embrace the new and not say it's impossible or I've never done it before. It's never happened before, but God will do it. He has promised it. He's never wrong. Trust him. Believe him. It's time. Amen. It's now time for our ordinance of humility. And uh, for communion, we open communion to any baptized Christian. So if you are a baptized Christian, whether you are a Seventh-day Adventist or not, you are welcome to participate. The fellowship hall will have the couples and families, and there are separate rooms to my right, one for the ladies and one for the men. Let's dismiss now for the ordinance of humility. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We will now have the prayer for the bread. As we are about to partake of this emblem of your broken body for us, when we think about your sacrifice, we can hardly comprehend what you really did for us. That you, the Creator God, would leave heaven and condescend to come down to this earth in the form of a human, knowing that you would be ridiculed, beaten, spat upon, and crucified on a cross. It's hard to comprehend such amazing love, but we are so grateful for it. So, Father, I just pray your blessing on this emblem of the bread. Help us to remember each day to feed on the bread of life, the word of, of God, that it might change us and transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
body which is broken for you. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We'll now have the prayer for the Jews. May our participation in, in taking of it draw us closer to you and strengthen our relationship with you so that we might be in that group that's ready to meet you when you come again. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus said, drink ye all of it. This is my blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much that we are cleansed again, that your precious blood has the power not only to change our old life, but to give us a new one. So Father, we pray that as we leave this place and begin a new year, that we will be more determined to believe your promises, to trust your love, and to seek for a deeper relationship with you. Thank you, Father. Bless everyone here. Bless them this new year, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Bible says they said a prayer and then sang a hymn and went out. And as we go out, there will be an offering for the poor at the door. Let's turn and sing together number 287, Softly and Tenderly. 